Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Angelique Leentjes. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Engineering Cell Lines for Cultured Needs. This uh, webinar is hosted to you by the TU Delft Extension School for Continuing Education. Please raise your questions in the chat, and we're in the Q&A, I should say, and we will uh, answer as many as possible uh, during the, the webinar. Um, our speaker of today is Josh Fleck, Assistant Professor um, of the Biotechnology Department at the TU Delft. Josh, welcome to you as well. Please go ahead and um, the floor is all yours. Super. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Angelique. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining to, to hear a bit about uh, cultured meats and, uh, and and cellular agriculture and, and my research in, in this area. I think I see there's about 100 participants. So that's, uh, yeah, really exciting and really an honor to uh, get to uh, spend lunchtime telling you a bit about some of the, the ideas I have in, in this kind of space. So um, as Angelique said, I uh, will look at the Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions that arise, please uh, don't hesitate to, to post them there. And um, I think my talk will be about 30, 40 minutes, maybe something like that. And um, hopefully that leaves us a good a bit of time for, for some questions and, and discussion at the end. So um, yeah, with that in mind, I'll uh, kick off by giving you a little bit of an introduction to what the, the main idea is for cultured meat, why we think this might be a good alternative uh, to our current food system for at least some products. And then I'll try and explain some of the problems, some of the hurdles we have for making this technology a reality, um, and in particular focusing on cell lines and what we need mammalian cells to be able to do for this technology. And I'll try and wrap up by putting that into a little bit of context when it comes to the regulatory environment and the consumer acceptance of these types of products, which of course are very new and in some cases uh, can be quite scary for, for consumers. And um, yeah, hopefully if we achieve that, then you guys will have learned something about cultured meats. You'll have a better sense of how close we are to making this a reality and have a little bit of an insight into some of the considerations that uh, go into designing these types of processes. And, and this is really something that lots of people in TU Delft are beginning to work on. So it's pretty relevant for our, for our university and our work here. So let me just work out how to get the slides going. Looks good. So yeah, what is the what is the big idea here? So some people in the audience will probably know this. Others, for others, it will be more new. But the current food system, and especially our meat system, is kind of broken. It's uh, unfortunately it's really damaging for the environment, and it's also um, very uh, harmful for a large number of of animals. So um, these numbers are a little bit hard to. Uh, estimate or, or, or to calculate very accurately, but most um, most of the models, uh, most of the calculations suggest that somewhere between 13 and 17 percent of uh, all global greenhouse gas emissions are caused by the farming and livestock industries. So that's a really massive chunk, much bigger than tourism or aviation or some of these other sectors that we traditionally think of uh, as being extremely climate damaging. Actually, the, the meat industry is, is, is really up there contributing a huge chunk. Somewhere around 100 billion animals per year are killed uh, for food. So yeah, that's about 15 or so per, per human on the planet. And the vast majority of, of these are birds, including chickens, but pigs and cows also make up sizable proportions of, of these numbers. And it's known that the livestock industry is also a major source of disease and, and various other negative externalities. So it's very tasty. People don't want to stop eating it, but unfortunately, it's it's also a, a an industry with, with with a lot of issues. So, the big idea that I want to introduce to you is to not have to replace um, these these foods, these tasty food products, with uh, complete alternatives, or that everyone has to be vegetarian, but to try to produce some similar products, but in a much less uh, damaging and and in an animal unfriendly fashion. And that's to, that's to grow these, uh, these products directly from cells. And what I'm showing you on the screen here is, is a little bit of a sample process for what this cultivated or, or cultured meat production looks like. I'm not going to go into it in a huge amount of depth because we don't have time to, 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 to go into all those details. But safe to say these are uh, complicated processes with many steps. But the basic logic is, is fairly simple. 
we take the cells from an animal and then we uh, grow them outside of the animal in something akin to a uh, to a brewery in, in, in bioreactors, something that looks a bit like a traditional uh, food production process. Um, and that's where the actual uh, cellular mass is produced and subsequently differentiated into the different types of tissue that make up meat products. And, and these are preliminary uh, muscle and, and, and fat. So um, this is the, 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 the basic idea. And to just give you a little bit more of a, of a visual illustration, this process still starts with an animal. We still have to, uh, we still have to take, take cells from, from a live animal. Um, but rather than uh, to grow a huge amount of, of cows, we then take these cells and, and grow them in a lab. Perhaps we perform some engineering or some modification on those cells. And that's something I'll talk about a lot more today. But once those cells have been engineered, they go into an upscaled uh, production facility full of bioreactors. As I said, something a, a bit akin to a brewery. Um, and finally, from that food production facility, we then produce our edible food products. And, and these can be a variety of, of different uh, unstructured uh, products like mints or burgers or meatballs. Um, but eventually, of course, we also hope to produce more uh, complex uh, structured products like steaks or or, or other full uh, tissue cuts. So um, that's the big idea. We want to produce food from cells and in doing so come up with meat alternatives or alternative protein products that have uh, reduced uh, negative externalities with respect to the climate and, and with respect to animals. And this technology does already exist in a proof of principle stage. Um, so it's not like this is entirely fanciful. It's already been more than 10 years since um, Mark Post in Maastricht um, or from Maastricht launched the first uh, proof of principle uh, hamburger produced from bovine satellite cells. And these days there's been a number of regulatory approvals uh, in Singapore and, and also in the, in the US, as well as uh, various proof of principle demonstrations and, and tastings. So they already exist. But we're certainly not yet at the stage that this is a widespread, uh, widely adopted technology. And there's a few different reasons for that. Um, these first products are what's generally known as hybrid products. So they're not made wholly of animal cells. They usually contain just a small amount, small proportion of animal cells, which are then mixed or blended with plant-based plant proteins or, or plant-based products to create uh, a large mass that you can actually eat. They don't mimic traditional meat very well, and that might be kind of obvious if only a small proportion of, of, of the cellular mass is actually coming from animal cells. Um, but they don't taste like traditional meat yet. And at the molecular level, they also don't look like traditional meat just yet. And I think I don't quite see on my... But um, they're also very expensive. I don't know if you see this on the slides. It's, it's covered up on, on my screen, unfortunately. But they're, they're also very expensive. And there's a really a long way to go before we reach the price parity for these, these products. So it's a, it's, a, it's a cool idea on paper. There's proof of principles there. But we still really have a long way to go to actually make this a reality. And so what is the role of, of cell engineering? Where do, where do I come into this process or where, do, where does my group come in? Um, and we really come in at the stage of, of cell line engineering. We want to try and improve the cells that go into this process such that um, we can make these processes more, more cheap. We can make them more efficient. We can make cells um, which contribute to tastier food products and, and, and th these types of things. So, what I want to go back is to this kind of simple process diagram that we showed and just give you a bit of extra information and, and an extra way of looking at this process. And that's to really imagine this as a flow of cells. So being able to perform one of these processes um, at scale and robustly really comes down to a, an accurate understanding and manipulation of, of cells. And this is really why, as a cell biologist, I think this is a very interesting topic to be, uh, to be working on. So why might we want to um, engineer cells? Um, I think here, this is quite an interesting point to just pause for a second and, and compare the idea of engineering an animal, which uh, has something that humans have been doing through selective breeding for millennia already, and compare that breeding of animals, engineering of, of animals with opportunities for engineering cells, which I think, yeah, there's quite a lot of advantages. So when you engineer an animal, 
firstly, this is going to take a long time because there's always a generation time of years, um, especially for these larger mammals. So you really need to wait a long time before you see the, the product of your engineering. It's low throughput. Um, you still need to actually have a, a living cow at the end of your process. So that can limit the, the scope for engineering that you can do. And of course, it's very ethically fraught and kind of the, the aim of our process is to try to eliminate some of those ethical uh, issues with, with meat consumption. On the other hand, when it comes to engineering cells, this is quick. You can do lots of different modifications in parallel because your cells don't need to produce a cow at the end of the day, just a steak, then you have many more options for genes that you can modify. Um, and you know the, the ethical uh, uh, dilemmas are, are obviously much reduced when it comes to this. And so that's, that's why it might be uh, possible or might, might be a good idea to, to engineer cells for these kind of technologies. And I think it's also important to think about why we need to and in that sense, it's definitely good to um, put the field in context and to highlight that although there's been successes with these early proof of principle products, um, there's also a lot of challenges that cultured meat faces. And these are coming from various directions. Um, the, the, the products that we're trying to compete with, the meat industry is, is huge and, and prices are very cheap. Um, the economic climate is making it more difficult for companies to raise funding. Various techno-economic analyses have highlighted that it's going to be very difficult for these uh, products to ever reach um, comparison comparative levels with uh, with traditional meat production, and that's largely because they might be very energy intensive. Um, and there's also growing sentiment in various parts of the world that these types of technologies are not what we should be opting for. Um, and so this is creating a little bit of a storm for the for the industry at the moment, and people are starting to look a little bit more skeptically at whether these processes can can work. And I think this is really where squeezing the most from the cells, engineering our cells to be as optimal uh, as possible, is really going to help to um, push these these processes closer to viability. So this I mentioned uh, briefly already, but just to highlight, it's certainly not the case that. This is the first time that people have been trying to, or humans have been trying to engineer life forms for food. Actually, this has been going on for millennia already, first with animals, which were selectively bred, later with plants, uh, once humans started to settle and, 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 and become more agricultural. Um, and more recently, people have also been, been uh, selecting uh, microbes and yeast for all sorts of food processes, including bread and, and beer production. So there's really quite a bit of history that we can look back on, but also a large array of new tools available right now, so that when it comes to engineering cells and engineering cells for cultivated meat processes, we can kind of skip some of those slower, more old school methods and go straight to very precise targeted engineering of cells to give them the behaviors and the traits that we need for, for our particular process. Um, it's also worth highlighting that this technology, cultured meat and, and cellular agriculture is certainly not the only place that people are engineering animal cells. And in fact, there's already quite a big sector um, growing in the medical and the biomedical space uh, with, with precisely this idea. Um, just for example, people are using uh, animal cells, often these Chinese hamster ovary cells to produce antibodies and to produce vaccine components. And that's, uh, that's a growing uh, market and, and, and people are really starting to upscale the production of, uh, of these types of products. Likewise, people are interested in engineering cells as therapeutic products in themselves. And this can be seen, for example, in cancer immunotherapy and various other types of, of stem cell therapy, where uh, cells are removed from a patient, they're engineered, and then they're, um, and then they're put back into the patient where they will have a, a biological effect. So in the biomedical space, there's certainly plenty of tools, and there's also some of the traits that people are engineering into these cells, which we can use as inspiration for, for our methods. Um, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's really another order of magnitude that we need for the, for the meat industry. So we need to be looking still one or even two orders of, orders of magnitude higher for these types of, of production processes than has ever been seen in the, in the biomedical industry. So that also 
gives us a little bit of a sense of just how important it's going to be to have really optimized uh, cells for, for, for these types of processes. So that's a little bit of an intro that uh, hopefully kind of motivates a little bit the idea of cultured meat, why it might be interesting to make food products from cells, and then maybe gives you some insight into some of the challenges, some of the problems that are coming at this idea, and why engineering our cells might be a good way to make these technologies more viable. So for the second part of the talk, I want to um, move on a little bit and dive into some examples of how people in this industry are already starting to engineer cells in, in this fashion. Um, and to do that, I like to use this, this kind of wheel, phenotype wheel diagram, um, which is from a perspective that we just published uh, last week. Um, so it's in a pre-proof pre stage if, if you want to go and read it. But the important thing here is not to remember every single one of these 10 phenotypes that you see on the wheel. Um, this is just a flavor or, or a set of examples of different types of, um, of trait that we would like our cells to potentially have. Um, and I know from my time uh, previously working in the, in the industry, if you have cells which don't have these different behaviors, just how difficult it's gonna be to build a process around that. So just for example, um, if your cells are not immortalized, you're going to have to go back to the animal uh, very often to, uh, to get new cell samples. And um, in doing so, you will run into a lot of problems with batch to batch variation or, or, or other issues. Um, if your cells don't proliferate quickly, of course, you have to run your process very long, which is going to increase the cost and the, and the energy usage and, and, and these types of things. So I have really a firsthand experience of how frustrating it can be to build a process around cells that don't have some of these, these traits. So with that in mind, let's just um, dive a little bit into uh, some of the examples that, that people have already um, done to, to engineer diff different parts of this, of this kind of phenotype wheel. So um, some of, lots of the examples I'm gonna be talking about come from, from Andrew Stout's work. Um, he was a PhD student in the in the Kaplan lab at Tufts University in uh, in Boston, and also someone I collaborate with quite a lot. And um, there's really only about three or four articles already published in this field, and and I think he's been uh, the lead author on on two or three of them. So so really quite the expert when it comes to this uh, to this type of, uh, of of cell engineering. Um, but this is this is this is a good first example. I already mentioned immortalization. A little bit and what i mean by immortalization of cells is the um, ability to continue proliferating robustly for an unlimited period of time and if you are someone that knows about uh, bacterial or yeast processes then this is probably not a concept that has really is, is super relevant to you bacteria and yeast always are very good at uh, continuing to proliferate but mammalian cells don't have this behavior. You can see in, in black on this curve that if you continue to grow um, adult stem cells, then after a certain amount of time, they will really start to proliferate more slowly. The cell division rate will drop. The cells also become larger and, and experience various morphological changes um, and all things that basically are gonna kill our production process in its tracks because the cells just stop growing. So what Andrew did um, in this proof of principle study was to take two genes um, from, from the cow and to, uh, to overexpress them, to boost their expression levels. And these genes are the telomerase, uh, re uh, reverse transcriptase, which extends the, uh, the ends of, of chromosomes and CDK4, which is a, uh, a protein which promotes the cell cycle uh, entry. And you can see that when he combined the overexpression of these two genes, he uh, was able to generate a cell line which continued to proliferate robustly for, uh, for over 75 days. And in fact, I know that he ran the experiments quite a bit longer than this. And so in doing so, what he had created is a stable, immortalized cell line, which from which you can begin to add new modifications and, and, and engineer further uh, phenotypes from the wheel on top of this immortalization. So this is one example of a follow-up study that he, that he then uh, performed, starting from his immortalized cells. Um, and one thing that's important to note when it comes to this cultivated meat or cultured meat production processes is that the cost of the medium 
that the cells grow in is a very high driver of the of the total cost. Mammalian cells need these complicated media, uh, media, lots of amino acids and vitamins, proteins, and growth factors that both provide the raw materials for cells to grow and differentiate, and also provide the signals that trigger them to do that. And what FGF uh, is, is an is a important growth factor that provides a pro-growth signal to the cells. And a vast majority of, of different cell lines um, in the industry need this FGF. Um, but it's very expensive. It has to be purified from, from bacteria or yeast or, or other recombinant systems. Um, and it's expensive. And it also has its own uh, ecological footprint associated with that raw material. So what Andrew did was to um, consider that maybe he could engineer his cells to not need FGF in the medium anymore. And he tested this in two different ways. One was to um, engineer the cells so they would produce their own FGF, which could then signal back to themselves. And the second was to overexpress a protein RAS, which is uh, downstream in the signaling pathway that FGF triggers. So in, in essence, the cells are tricked into thinking that FGF is, is present the whole time. Um, and when he uh, used either one of these, uh, of these genes or combined them together, then he was able to produce cells which can grow in the absence of, of FGF. So they're able to grow in a cheaper, simpler media, and they will continue to, to do so robustly um, for, for, the, for the remaining uh, life of, of those cells. So this is just a proof of principle study um, for, for one growth factor, but it shows the idea that, that you can start to really manipulate the needs of these cells and in doing so bring down the cost of the, of the process. Um, this is the, the, the third study that I'm going to mention and, and um, it has a slightly different angle. Um, it's known that um, meat consumption and, and red meat consumption in particular is associated with uh, an increase of, of certain diseases. And one of the mechanisms uh, behind this is thought to be, um, oh sorry, is thought to be an increase in the in the level of oxidation and and pro uh, pro oxidative compounds that uh, that the that that come with with red meat consumption, and so what Andrew did here was he engineered um, his cells to express a new uh, vitamin synthesis pathway. Um, which would produce beta carotene, which is uh, actually the, the compound that makes carrots orange. Um, and he did this by, by bringing three genes from, uh, from bacteria, which have this uh, beta carotene synthesis pathway and putting them into his, his cow cell lines. Um, and you can see in the, in the plots that once he expressed these three genes, the level of beta carotene in his cells was, was elevated. Um, and this led to a reduction in the, in the amount of oxidative uh, stress that these uh, that these cells were experiencing so this is really a way that you can uh, not just modulate the cell behavior but potentially also the um the the nutritional profile of, of a final product and you can do this in a way which is quite a bit more controlled than you could in the traditional meat industry so those are the three uh those are the the, the three published papers that i wanted to mention I think it's also quite interesting to dive sometimes into the patents and the and the patent literature in 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 this field. Um, lots of the work is being done in companies, and and some of that makes it out into the public domain, but but not all of it. So it's certainly the case that lots of the the companies in this sector are also doing uh, are doing cell line engineering, and and maybe have come up with some interesting developments that can help uh, bring this technology closer to to viability. So this is a patent filing from, from Sci-Fi Foods in the US. Um, and what they were interested in doing was trying to create cells which can grow in suspension. And what I mean by this is, is most of those previous experiments we looked at, the cells always are attached to a particular substrate. And that's how mammalian cells usually grow. They are bound up to an extracellular matrix or some sort of underlying substrate. But from a bioprocess perspective, that's going to be quite annoying. It would be much better if we could grow our cells in large stirred tank reactors where the cells are not attached to something. And this is what Sci-Fi Foods wanted to do here. They made a variety of different cell lines where particular genes are knocked out. And so, for example, here in green, you can see that this combination of caspase 3 and ITGB1, when knocked out, that produced a cell line which was able to grow uh, more easily in, in suspension. 
And just one final example is, is about metabolism and, and waste metabolites. This is from Upside Foods. So that's formerly known as Memphis Meats. So they are one of the probably one of the most advanced companies in the in the space, and they have a regulatory approval uh, in the US. And one of their patent filings uh, shows that they were interested in this uh, glutamine pathway and in the production of ammonia, which is a toxic uh, waste metabolite that builds up to high levels in, in mammalian cell cultures. And what they showed in this admittedly fairly limited uh, set of uh, patent filings um, was that when they expressed this new enzyme glutamine synthetase or GS, then the amount of ammonia in the in the cell culture medium was was reduced and the cells were able to grow to a to a higher density. Um, and so that's a, an, another way that you can reduce costs and increase the the, the productivity of, of, of one of these processes. So that's a little bit of a quick demonstration of some of the different ways that people have been playing with these cells, new behaviors, new phenotypes that they've been engineering in them, and some of the different tools that, that people are using. And, and this is really only a, a small set of examples, and that's because this is quite a new field with not many players in it just yet. And, and some of the work that is out there is in companies who are not saying so much about what they're doing. Um, but nevertheless, hopefully gives you a bit of a uh, flavor that there's quite a lot of different potential when it comes to, to cell line engineering. And, and, and this is what I would like my group to, to be continue working on here, here in Delft. Um, I think that being said, it's definitely important for a, for a webinar like this to give a bit of the big picture and a, and a bit of the context and to, to definitely state that everything that I've kind of outlined in the scientific part of the talk is, is certainly not generally uh, agreed upon by 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 everyone um and genetic modification of of food um is certainly a is certainly a, a sticky topic in a in a number of in a number of places and, and europe especially there's a, there's a lot of resistance to this so i think it's um only fair to kind of balance some of the advantages against the disadvantages or the or the regulatory or the consumer uh, concerns that you might run into if you propose to start engineering cells for, for food. And this can be seen in, uh, in a variety of different places, you know, um, Greenpeace and, and various other environmental organizations do a lot of good, good work, but um, they also have adopted some somewhat anti-scientific positions um, when it comes to food safety and safety of, of genetically modified foods for which the scientific literature shows that there's not really a lot of uh, risk to human health or any risk to human health. There's certainly plenty of um, reasons to be wary of, of genetic modification for food, and they can be to do with um, monopolies and use of pesticides and, and these types of things. So certainly there's, there's important issues to, to consider, but from a food safety perspective, there's no real evidence of, of this being problematic. But nevertheless, there's a variety of NGOs and, and other um, parties who are who are interested in trying to uh kind of cloud the the the, the data and, and 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 push their own narratives when it comes to to these types of, of food products and you can see even in the responses to the to this webinar there was a number of uh negative responses um and so this is definitely a, a technology that um yeah, it can be quite polarizing and, and, and requires us as scientists and as science communicators to be quite careful about how we go about um, yeah, promoting these types of technologies or, or discussing the type of work that we're doing and really deciding as a society is, is, is this the direction that we want to go in. So um, with, this, with this in mind, what I want to start kind of finishing with is to try to leave you guys with um, a little bit of an impression of the variety of tools that we can use for this cell line engineering and to try to um, get across to you that for different geographies where the regulations are different or for, for different types of product, we can adopt um, cell line engineering strategies from different parts of the, of the spectrum. So this again is a, is a figure from the perspective that I mentioned, and it's a figure that I quite often show to um, try to um, try to show people the, the trade-off that can be made between um, more, um, um, more uh, aggressive genetic modification in a way where you're bringing uh, foreign genes 
or large uh, pieces of, of new DNA into your cells. And you can see these kind of on the on the left hand side of these this plot. Um, and, and, and these techniques really give you a lot of power for engineering your cells to bring new phenotypes to play with some of those uh, different traits that, that we've already discussed. Um, but they also will make it more difficult for um, you to get your product through a regulatory approval or, um, or, or to, be, uh, to, be, to be ordered by, by uh, genetic modification skeptical uh, customers. And that's really why it's worth thinking about a variety of, of different tools which are perhaps um, more precise, more subtle in the modification that they produce, but can still um, give your cells uh, give give your cells new new benefits. And gene editing is really uh, one area that I think is is quite promising in in this respect. The basic uh, premise of gene editing is that you don't bring any new or foreign genetic material into your cells. You just rearrange or shuffle or move the material that's already there. And that's something that people have already been doing for millennia with, with selective breeding is, is exactly this. You, um, by chance, you shuffle or you rearrange genes which are already present. Um, and I think there's quite good um, uh, chances that this gene editing in the future will be considered more favorably than, uh, than, than genetic modification. And we can already see this, that the, the gene editing legislation uh, differs geographically. In some places, US and, and Canada, this is already embraced. Um, in Europe, as of right now, um, gene editing is still considered genetic modification, but there's a regulation uh, or, or a proposal for new regulation, which is working its way through the European Parliament, which at least for plants, um, proposes that these uh, gene edited, precisely gene edited plants will not be considered genetically modified. So I'm quite hopeful that in a longer time scale, you know, five or 10 years, um, it can also be the case that, uh, that these kind of regulations will, will, will come to, to cellular agriculture and to, to animal cells as well. Um, so it's, a, it's certainly a, a regulatory environment that's in flux and it's very important to consider this when you are designing your, your cell line engineering strategy. So I think that's um, pretty much everything that I wanted to, 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 to kind of um, say to you guys today to give you a bit of an introduction to cultured meat in general, talk about cells and the importance of engineering them, and to highlight that it's not as simple as just making a great cell line. You also have to think about the tools and the techniques that you're going to do this and how that's going to um, interact with the regulators and how that's going to interact with, with consumers. So these are, these are my conclusions, I'd say. Um, it's certainly a promising technology. It certainly has the, the potential to avoid a lot of the negative externalities that are associated with the traditional meat industry, but it's certainly not ready for the big time just yet. The scale is, is tiny, the costs are too high, um, the, the supply chains are not in place, and, and there's, a, there's a whole lot of things that need to happen before we see these products really become available in any sort of widespread fashion. Um, that being said, cell line engineering is an important area or promising area that can really help accelerate the um, accelerate the, the delivery of, of, of cultured meat to market. Um, but we need to consider how we're going to use it, what type of techniques we're going to use, and how that might impact the, 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 the impression of these products with the regulators and, and with the consumers. So, yeah, that's um, what I wanted to, to talk to you about this, this lunchtime. I hope you, you found it somewhat interesting. This is just uh, some, some, some quick acknowledgements. And before we open the q and I just have a couple of other kind of slides to, to plug. But a big thanks to, um, to everyone in TU Delft who is, who's been working on, on cellular agriculture and, and these types of uh, topics. My position is funded by a National Growth Fund uh, grant from... Um, from the Dutch government, and it was used to set up this Cellular Agriculture Netherlands uh, program. Um, and then there's a number of PhD students and, and other group leaders uh, also um, being paid from, from this fund. So massive thanks to them. Lots of the, um, the, the background to some of the work I showed, um, it comes from uh, my previous position in, in Mozameet, where I worked as the, as the head of cell biology. And so that's uh, where a lot of the, the plans and the, the ideas for this research came from. Um, and also a shout out to, um, to my collaborators in, in Tufts who uh, worked on that perspective from which I, I drew a, a couple of the figures. 
So yeah, I think the webinar will be recorded after, or maybe you can find the slides, but there's a few links. Um, if you want to check out Cellular Agri Agriculture Netherlands, then here's the homepage. Um, here in the biotechnology department, we're contributing to an advanced course, um, which will be uh, delivered this November. So if this is a topic you're interested, you might want to check that out. It's going to be three days, lots of expert speakers, uh, various different group activities, and a really good way to get further insight into this field. Um, if you're particularly interested in cell line engineering, then you can always contact me for more details, but we have a kind of research network with a with a Slack workspace that we use for discussing these, these types of topics. And so there's also careers uh, discussion, upcoming positions, discussion of articles as, as, as well as science. So um, an interesting place potentially if, uh, if this is a field that you're interested in, in, in learning more about. Um, and I think um, Angelique will, will also mention uh, at the end, but there's plenty of other interesting um, online courses and, and webinars that you can follow via via the extension school. So um, yeah, with that in mind, I will um, have a quick breath and maybe I can open the Q&A and see if there's already some, some questions in here that might be interesting. Okay, so what have we got? Travis Kalu says, are, can these gene expression changes all be accomplished epigenetically to avoid the GMO restrictions in some countries? Yes, amazing question, Travis. So I didn't really talk about it too much in, the, in, in my presentation, but certainly epigenetic editing, I think is a really interesting um, potential method that can be used here. So for people who don't know what this is, the, the, the basic principle is, is that lots of these gene editing methods involve a permanent change to the, to the genome, but there's also ways that you can, um, uh, you can change the cell's behavior without a permanent change in, uh, in the genome. And you can do this, for example, by using um, catalytically inactive uh, versions of, of CRISPR-Cas9 systems, which just bring uh, transcription factors to a gene of, of interest. So yeah, I think it's certainly an interesting area. There hasn't really been too many articles or really any articles published on using CRISPR-A or CRISPR-I for cultivated meat, but I think it's certainly an area that some companies are probably looking into. And I personally would uh, would love to have some projects in, in this kind of area. So um, yeah, good, uh, good question. Janine says, thanks for the engaging present. If you, oh, where's, if you could choose one of the challenges to be magically resolved, what would it be and why? Um, yeah, I think it, it depends a little bit on which um, cell type you, you, you are particularly working with. So some people in the cultivated meat industry start with pluripotent stem cells um, where they already grow nicely in suspension um, but they're much harder to differentiate accurately. So it's not really quite as simple, I would say, as one of the, one of the places on this wheel is, is much more important than others. That being said, we work on these adult stem cells. Um, and I think I'm really excited about this suspension um, culture adaptation that the sci-fi foods pattern showed and whether we can use this because once your cells are in suspension, then you really... Um, you really have a, a lot more bioprocess flexibility to, to, to grow these cells um, without having to worry about having them in adherent flasks and, and this type of stuff. So I think this, uh, this suspension growth, anoikis resistance, whatever you want to call it, is probably a, probably a, a good first phenotype that we would like to, to have solved. Um, Ivona, Ivona says, during the presentation, it was mentioned that some components of cell culture media can be replaced with yeast bacterial cultivated ingredients. Are there currently any fully cell culture derived media available or do they contain components directly sourced from animals? Yeah, good question. So um, nearly the majority of people in the industry, I think I would say are using definitely serum free media. So there's no serum in there. That doesn't, of course, mean that there can't be other components which are derived from animals. So, for example, albumin is quite a common additive to cell culture media. And you can get recombinant albumin, which is produced in, in yeast, for example, or in some plants. But the amounts can be small. There can be a lot of batch-to-batch -batch variation. So 
I would say this is not a fully solved challenge and some people's media do still have some animal derived components, but in general, it's getting closer and closer to people having fully animal free formulations. And I believe that the approved products in the US and the Singapore are indeed with animal component free media. Um, so yeah, it's a good question. One of the main criticisms of the industry is that people often say that you're still using FBS, you're still using serum. Um, and that's usually that's usually inaccurate these days. But uh, it's certainly still the case that uh, we need to look carefully at, at these at these supply chains for these. Okay, if you would, uh, Mariam says, so, so many thanks. If you would choose a cell type to use, which would you select, pluripotent, multi, or uni? Yeah, so th this is a good question. Um, and I, I sort of answered it a little bit earlier that depending on which cell type you start with, you're going to have some advantages, a bit of a head start on some parts of this wheel. And in other places, you're going to be further behind. So if you have... Um, if you have very totipotent embryonic stem cells or, or pluripotent stem cells, often these can grow in suspension quite nicely and you don't have so much problem with immortalization, but the proliferation rate can be slower and the differentiation can be harder compared to say adult stem cells. So I think there's a bit of a, there's a bit of a trade off there and it's not super easy to say what you should start with. It depends a bit on your philosophy for what you think cultivated meat should look like what you want your final product to to look like so i hope in in my group to ha to have a variety of, of different starting cell types that we work on and it'll be interesting to see whether some modifications we make to say change the metabolic efficiency of a, of a cell type would work in in a variety of different cell backgrounds for example um so yeah i think it's um it's a little bit difficult to say exactly what to start with. And you can see this because companies in the field are for sure opting for a number of, of different strategies. Kalisa says, as cell lines are considered to be an input for the production process, what's your take on the final products being evaluated under existing GE or GM frameworks? Is there such a requirement? Yeah, so I think, um, yeah, the, if, if your cells are genetically modified, then for sure the final product will also be considered genetically modified under most of the food frameworks. I have to say I'm not a big reg regulatory expert, but certainly in Europe, if you are genetically modifying your cells, then the final product will also be genetically modified. And so companies who are trying to apply for regulatory approval in Europe are generally steering away from any sort of genetic modification or, or gene editing. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's basically the, the answer. And, and again, as I said in the presentation, these regulations are certainly in flux. And just because a certain type of cell engineering technique is considered genetic modification today, doesn't mean that it necessarily will next year or that it will in, an, in another location. So people applying in, in Singapore and in the US um, certainly might be, be able to play with different rules or be able to uh, adopt different strategies without being pushed into that genetic modification type uh, pathway. Class says, so cell line engineering is really necessary. Without this approach, there's no viable business case for cultured meat, right? Uh, yes, I think that cell line engineering is necessary. I don't think it's gonna work without, without it. Um, what that doesn't necessarily mean, and hopefully you get this from the presentation, is that that doesn't mean that genetic modification is really necessary. So I certainly think that we need to have improved cells, but it doesn't mean that they have to be genetically modified or that you have to apply down a GMO food pathway. And some people sometimes miss that subtlety and they think that this means cultured meat has to be GMO. And I think that's not the case, but certainly we need to squeeze as many benefits out of the cells as, as possible. Um, Michelle, are there known inducible systems based on mammalian genomes to be used in cisgenic modification projects? If not, how could cisgenic systems be controlled? Okay, that's, that's a really interesting question. So in general, um, if people want to make inducible animal cell lines, they often bring systems from other kingdoms of life. So for example, they use a tetracycline inducible system from bacteria. 
Um, and if we do that, of course, then your cells are going to be genetically modified, which might not be, be what you want. So I certainly think, Michelle, that there's some interesting examples for um, sit for projects for for cisgenic inducible systems. We know that cells, mammalian cells can respond to heat shock. We know that they can respond to foreign genetic material within a, with a powerful interferon response. Um, we know that they have a hypoxic response. So I think there's a variety of systems that you could take that are already present in mammalian cells, and you could turn these into cisgenic switches. That being said, I don't think any of those are necessarily super straightforward or going to work very easily. I think they're great ideas for for projects for people to work on. And I think I know of at least one project where people are trying to turn the heat shock response into a, into an inducible system. And I think they're getting somewhere, but they still need to overexpress some components of the, of the system using powerful promoters. So I don't think they've got to full cisgenic um, inducible systems just yet, but I certainly think that's an, an interesting area. Alvaro says, would a future cell line factory be more similar to a conventional brewery or a pharmaceutical clean room? Yeah, I think it's going to have to be somewhere in between. Um, we certainly don't, can't, it, it won't be practical for it to be like a pharmaceutical clean room for the, the types of products that we produce. But of course, these processes are inherently uh, prone to microbial contamination. So in a brewery, you have yeast around everywhere, and that can even be important if you're making a sour beer or, or, or depending on your process. Um, so I think it needs to it needs to look like a brewery in terms of scale and in terms of the ease of using the equipment. Um, but it needs to be cleaner and whether it needs to be sterile, whether we can produce cell lines, which are can help with ensuring sterility, I think is a is an interesting question. Um, but yeah, also something that you should find a bioprocess person to, to ask about because for sure the design of these facilities and the, and the upscaling is a, is a really interesting uh, problem that also needs to be solved. And I certainly wouldn't want to suggest that, you know, cell line engineering is the only or even the main challenge here. There's really a lot of multidisciplinary advances that, that need to come together. Okay. Ella says, nice intro talk. Thanks. Just interested in what your view on immortalized cells via spontaneous or GM being compared to cancerous cells. How can we distinguish between immortalized and cancerous uncontrolled growth? Yeah. So that's, a, that's also a really good question and definitely a very relevant one when it comes to the attitude and the optics around this, um, this type of technology. So Certainly some of the phenotypes that you see on this kind of wheel diagram are also phenotypes that you see in cancerous or precancerous cells. And especially that means immortalization and it means fast proliferation. Um, but in lots of other respects, um, we're also different from, from cancerous cells. And I think one of the main ones there is genetic stability and ensuring that our cells, our cell lines maintain robust genetic stability. Um, we can easily assay this for ourselves and not only from an optics perspective, but also from a bioprocess perspective. We really need our cell lines to be very genetically stable so that we know that tomorrow's, next week's, next year's version of the process will still um, run as, as expected because the, because the cell lines are behaving robustly. So just because we have some um, similarities to cancerous cells in our cell lines doesn't mean that they're um, necessarily the same thing. And uh, I think genetic stability and uh, sensitivity to anti-growth signals and these type of things are all traits that our cell lines will will have. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Anonymous attendee says, how do you manage conversations with farmers to get them on board with this and show that it's a supplementary alternative pro protein option? Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. And I would say, um, when we say, well, how do you manage? Of course, it's, uh, that, that's not my particular area of, of expertise, but it's certainly um, something that many people in the industry are thinking about, trying to look ahead and to have farmers not be 
the competition or framed as the competition for this type of technology, but to be interested in the, in the possibilities here. So there's a number of in interesting initiatives in this direction. One of them is called Respect Farms, um, uh, which you, you, can, you can Google and see a bit about what their vision looks like. Um, certainly, um, there's, a, there's a variety of, of different uh, problems when it comes to the, the cell line engineering aspect and um, integrating this with, with a kind of farmer friendly vision for, for cultivated meat. Um, so yeah, in general, of course, there's some resistance, but also the few farmers that, that I've discussed with, or I've in interacted with during my career in this industry so far, I've, I've always been quite intrigued and, uh, and, and interested in the possibilities. And of, of course, these farmers are more aware than, than any of us about the, about some of the negative externalities when it comes to, to animal welfare and particularly at the, at the moment of slaughter. So, um, I think in general, usually they're, they're actually quite on board for, for these discussions. Jay Choi says, what specific cell characteristics to improve are you focusing on? Yeah, so that, that, that's a good question. So uh, in, the, in the presentation, I, I sadly didn't really show too many results from my, from my own group. And that's not because um, I'm trying to keep them sneaky. It's just because we're, we're just starting up. So I, I started uh, four or five months ago and um, we'll launch our first projects soon. So certainly immortalization is, is going to be one of the first projects. You need this to be able to then build other parts of the, of the wheel. And then I would certainly like to work on a few different areas. We'd like to work on the suspension cells. We would like to work on um, minim minimizing the medium requirements um, and, and, and a few other projects from this, from this list. Lorraine says, what are the CO2 emissions associated to cultured meat and how do they compare? Yeah, so at the moment, uh, the, 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 the error bars on the life cycle assessments are really big because you need to make a lot of assumptions when it comes to these types of processes. So for sure, they're very energy intensive right now. Um, and you need to make some kind of projections for how that energy intensity changes as these process scale up from lab scale to, to industrial scale. So there's a number of good LCAs out there. Hannah Tuomisto, I'd say is really the queen of these life cycle assessments and and they update them as the as more and more data is available so you can go and read some of her studies but in general you will find that under best case scenarios the cultured meat um, is, is much better than traditional meat but probably still worse than plant-based meat um, and in a worst case scenario then it starts to get less obvious whether this is really beneficial from a from a sustainability perspective um, that doesn't, of course, eliminate the animal welfare side of things, but I think it's um, it certainly remains to be seen how this all shakes out in the in the wash when you have a when you have an industrial scale process. Um, Indranil says, I have one question with less general overlap. We are working towards different engineering to meet the food requirements of the population. What is your comment on increased food density? which is a major cause of the food crisis. Increased food density. Yeah, I'm afraid I, I, I don't think I quite understand the question well enough to, to give, a, to give a, a clear answer on, on that one. I, I, it might be about energy density. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure about the question. Maybe if you can write it again, maybe I have a chance to, to answer it better. Where does the taste factor come into the process? <clears throat> Um, yeah, so obviously it's, it's very important that the cultured meat is, is very tasty. All of the studies show that people buy primarily on price and taste when it comes to these types of, of products. So having it be tasty is, is very important. Certainly you can use cell line engineering to, to modify the taste profile. Could be, for example, by expression of, of myoglobin or um, genes like this, which are known to alter the the meat's color and, and, and taste. Could be that by changing the proportion of fatty acids or other lipids, you can, you can change the taste. That's certainly a, a topic people are very interested in when it comes to fat cell engineering. Um, but also it, it's of course important that the way that the tissues are engineered um, and the final products are, are formulated, they also have a big contribution to the taste factor. So again, it's not 
something that you can only uh, that you can only solve with with cell engineering. Anonymous person says, "I'm interested in getting started. Is there a chance of a short stay or fellowship?" Yeah, anonymous attendee, I would definitely recommend that you sign up for that Accelera uh, Slack workspace that I mentioned, and and maybe you can meet some like-minded people for uh, for some discussion there. Julia says, "In the ideal future." How would you plug this meat in society, taking about ethical barriers? Do you think maybe expensive fine dining or a cheap, fast item? Yeah, I mean, for sure, the first products I think are going to be have to be marketed as expensive fine dining items. Um, yeah, again, it's something I, I think I leave a little bit to the to the social scientists and the and the marketeers. Of course, if you want to have a big impact in terms of climate and in terms of animals that you are saving from slaughter, then you need to be replacing a large amount of meat consumption. And most meat that's eaten is not in fine dining settings. It's in, it's in cheaper settings and in kitchens and in fast food restaurants. So yeah, if you want to have a big impact, then of course you want to aim for replacing as, as much meat consumption as, as, as possible. Michelle says about the epigenetic modifications, would they be inherited through multiple passages? Yeah, I think that's the biggest and most interesting question that needs to be answered so people can know if these epigenetic editing techniques are going to be effective. So I think there's good sense in the, in the field that at least the epigenetic inhibition, CRISPR-I, can have quite some long memory length. But I don't know exactly how that would be in our cells or in or in your cells. Um, I think CRISPR activation is a bit more unclear if you would really be able to have a, a long enough memory length to really reprogram a cell line and then use it for a whole production process before it forgets what you had engineered it to uh, to do. Um, yeah, there's there's too many there's too many questions for, for for me to answer them all. Let's just maybe pick one or two more. Under ideal conditions, in what period we'll be able to have some kind of fast food chain? Yeah, so um, yeah, that, that's maybe that's a good question to 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 end on. I don't know exactly how long it will be before this technology is really ready for the big time because there's just so many complexities to solve. Cell line engineering that I talked about today is just one piece of the puzzle. And um, like many technologies, it, it, it also is going to depend on the amount of funding, whether that funding can be allocated well, or whether we can get this community together to, to cooperate. You know, like maybe you got a sense we're on the slide about patents at the at the moment. Maybe you got a sense from the way I talked about it that it can be frustrating that some of this work is out there, but it's difficult to know what people have done. Um, so I think that's starting to change a bit and more companies are starting to, to publish their, um, publish their papers, but nevertheless, you know, people are probably replicating work a lot. And if we can try to iron out some of those issues and get a good amount of funding into this technology, then I think, you know, hopefully we're looking at some decades before we're really in big scale fast food type restaurants. I think that timelines more aggressive than that are, are very optimistic but um that being said it can be difficult to to predict and sometimes you just need a few big advances and then you really lead to like a major step change in the way that people think about this type of stuff so um yeah th thanks for all of those those questions are all really incredible and i'm really sorry that i don't have time to to answer all of them, but uh, I think we finish up now. Please, please uh, send me an email if you are uh, if you are interested in continuing the discussion. You can also find it via my uh, group page on the TU Delft website. Um, and uh, yeah, sign up for the for the Accelera uh, Slack where these types of questions and, and topics are, are being discussed on a on a daily basis. And um, yeah, just a big thanks again to Angelique and uh, and Joanna for inviting me to to give this this webinar and, and thank you everyone who uh, who joined and, and and paid attention and especially who uh, who made some nice questions so uh, thank you everyone thank you uh, josh uh, for your insightful presentation and uh, i'm sure there is uh, more food for thought uh, uh, so to say about this topic uh, also on engineering side ethical side 
So if you have more questions or feedback for us, please share that with, um, with us. Uh, we will send you a survey. Uh, would you be uh, interested in, uh, in this topic? Uh, please follow us on our socials um, uh, of the TU Delft uh, uh, about research and our courses. Um, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to, to end this, uh, this webinar. So thank you all for joining us and for your engaging uh, um, questions. Um, and we look forward to uh, seeing you uh, some other time in a webinar or in a course or uh, at another, uh, in another place. Bye-bye.